Your Royal Highness, Lords, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. What if there was a change that you could make on your farm that would reduce your carbon footprint by more than 50%? Well, for egg producers, that doesn't necessarily mean new equipment or big infrastructure changes, just a rethink in the way that we feed our hens. My journey to explore how we can achieve net zero in egg production took me across eight countries, from the prairies of Canada and America to laboratories in Europe and sustainable soy initiatives in Brazil and Argentina. Today, I want to share how alternative proteins, whether they're from beans, bugs, or even bacteria, can dramatically reduce the carbon footprint of egg production. Let's start with the challenge we're facing. Right now, around 80% of the carbon footprint of a typical egg can be attributed to the feed that hens consume. And the primary culprit, soya. It's a vital source of protein, but it comes with a heavy environmental cost. The production of soy in regions like Brazil and Argentina is linked to deforestation, which destroys critical ecosystems, reduces biodiversity, and contributes massively to global greenhouse gas emissions. On my travels, I investigated four main categories of alternative protein that I believe could revolutionize poultry feed. Grain legumes, insect protein, industry byproducts, and single cell protein. Each offers exciting possibilities, but also comes with their own set of challenges. Let's start with grain legumes, the homegrown heroes of protein. In the UK, faba beans have emerged as one of the most promising alternatives to soya. They can be grown locally, which reduces the need for imports and cuts transport-related emissions. Thanks to their low input requirement, faba beans boast a carbon footprint 25 times lower than deforestation-linked soya from Brazil. But here's the catch. Faba beans don't have the same balanced amino acid profile as soya. And moreover, they contain several anti-nutritional factors, with the most concerning being visine and convisine, which can negatively affect hens' health and performance. Thankfully, advancements in plant breeding are developing varieties with lower levels of these compounds. Next, let's look at industry byproducts, which are materials from other sectors that can be repurposed into animal feed. During my travels, I visited Niesen, a company in the Netherlands that collects surplus bakery products. We're speaking about bread, biscuits, and cakes, and transforms them into pig and poultry feed. Not only does this reduce food waste, but it also creates a circular economy where waste is reintroduced into the supply chain. One of the challenges with using byproducts, however, is their nutritional consistency. The feed's composition can vary depending on the source material, which means that feed producers must con constantly monitor and adjust the feed formulation to meet the hen's dietary needs. One significant development in alternative protein sources that I'm particularly excited about is the potential return of processed animal proteins, or PAP. Now, PAP may raise eyebrows due to its association with past food safety concerns, particularly following the BSE crisis in the 1980s. But since then, regulation and processing methods have evolved, and in 2021, the EU introduced new rules allowing PAP back into feed for certain species under strict guidelines. Public perception, however, in the UK remains a risk. Consumers may be hesitant about the idea of processed animal proteins and poultry feed, even if it is scientifically safe and highly regulated. During my travels, I visited Kipster, a low-carbon, high-welfare egg brand based in the Netherlands, who are embracing the use of alternative proteins. Their hens are fed on a diet that includes processed animal proteins, as well as insect meal from Nissan. By far, one of the most exciting alternatives is insect protein. Insects, particularly black soldier fly larvae, are incredibly efficient at converting low-grade organic waste into high-quality protein. They can be fed on feedstocks that can't be fed directly to other livestock, such as spoiled fruit and vegetables. 
The challenge with insect protein in the UK, however, is regulation. At, the, at the present, we're currently not allowed to feed insect meal due to the same regulation that prevents us from using PAP. And in Europe, where its use is allowed, all the producers that I visited were feeding their insects on feedstocks that could have been fed directly to other livestock, such as brewery grains, and even in some cases, soya-based poultry feed. Another current major barrier is scaling. Right now, the cost of production is too high, mainly due to the capital required to set up insect farms and the energy needed to run them. Most insect protein today is used in pet food or aquaculture, but within the next five to eight years, we expect it to become economically viable for use in the UK in poultry feed. Imagine a future where our hens are fed on insects that have been reared on waste. That's the kind of circular economy we need to drive sustainability. Another promising alternative protein source is dried distillers grains, or DDGS, a byproduct of ethanol production. When grains like maize, wheat, and barley are fermented to produce ethanol, DDGS remains as a protein rich byproduct. During my travels, I visited Optimal Aquafeed, where they're leading innovations to make DDGS even more protein dense. Through advanced centrifuge technology, they're concentrating the protein levels from 28% to as high as 50 and 60% protein, which is making it even more attractive for use in livestock feed. And in the US, it's already been used by several large-scale egg producers. Again, there are challenges around nutritional consistency and the potential concentration of mycotoxins. Lastly, we have single cell proteins, which are derived from microorganisms such as yeast, algae, and bacteria. Some of the most innovative research I encountered involved using CO2 from power plants to grow these microorganisms, turning greenhouse gas into a valuable resource. A project at the University of Kentucky is developing processes to cultivate algae using CO2 from coal power plants. The algae is then biorefined into products such as biodiesel, bioplastic, and protein-rich animal feed. Closer to home, Nottingham Trent University are involved in a project with a number of stakeholders that involves capturing CO2 from Drax power station, which will be fed to microbes to produce sustainable protein. It's a revolutionary idea, transforming CO2 into feed, but it's still at the early stages of development and scaling. Now, you may think, great, let's switch all hands to these alternative proteins and stop using soya. But it's not that simple. The reality is that no single alternative protein can replace soya completely. What we're looking at is a combination of proteins. Faba beans, insect meal, and bakery waste may all feature, as well as synthetic amino acids in a balanced diet for laying hens. This adds complexity to feed formulation, and it also raises costs. One of the main barriers is economic. Soya is not only highly nutritious, it's also incredibly cheap, thanks to economies of scale. Switching to alternative proteins will ultimately increase feed costs, and this cost must be borne by someone, whether it's the producer, the retailer, or the consumer. So, a crucial question is, who should pay for sustainability? Are consumers willing to pay a little more for eggs that are produced with a low carbon footprint? Despite the challenges, I'm optimistic. The, the development we're seeing in the progress of alternative proteins is remarkable. Take insect protein, for example. Companies like Better Insect Solutions predict that within a decade, we'll see insect meal that is cost competitive with soya. Investment in scaling up production facilities, reducing energy costs, and improving feed efficiency is ongoing. On the grain legume side, plant breeders are developing varieties with a higher protein content, better disease resistance, and lower levels of anti-nutritional factors. And this has been accelerated by the use of innovative technologies like speed breeding. There's also policy change on the horizon. In 2025, the UK is expected to lift the ban on processed animal proteins and insect meal. Change is also on the horizon for soya. 
with the EU set to implement the EU deforestation regulation, the EUDR, which will require all soya being imported into Europe to be certified, sustainable and segregated. So, how do we move forward? To achieve net zero in egg production, we need a concerted effort by all stakeholders. Retailers must incentivize the use of alternative proteins by offering premiums to producers who adopt sustainable practices. This may come in the form of differentiated egg brands that emphasize their low carbon footprint. This can already be seen on the shelves of Lidl, Morrisons and Sainsbury's. Governments must play their part too. Re investment in research and development is critical, whether it's in scaling up insect protein facilities or support for uh, breeding programs for faba beans. In closing, achieving net zero in egg production won't be a quick fix, but by integrating alternative proteins from homegrown legumes to innovative options such as insect meal and single cell proteins, we can make meaningful strides towards more sustainable operations. Finally, I'd like to say a massive thank you to the McRobert Trust for their generosity in sponsoring my scholarship. Thank you.